I'm very excited to introduce my friend and former co-worker Judy Rozofsky, who is now the Vermont State Entomologist. She's going to be talking to us about emerald ash borer and some other invasive insects that we should be looking out for. And I will say from the years of working with Judy, she knows insects very well. She's very good at identification. And I think Vermont is served very well by having her as our state entomologist. Well, thank you. So. Very kind of you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you all for coming on such a beautiful evening, too. All right, so I'm going to just sort of um, update you and brief you on the situation with emerald ash borer in the state. And Do you want um, to turn the lights off, Judy? Um, if, can people see? Or? Yeah. Um, okay. And then, um, you know, talk about where we found it and some of the regulatory stuff, which will bore everyone to death. And then um, also talk about some up and coming invasive species. So some of these slides I stole from my colleagues. I mean, I was assisted in the development of this talk by my <laughs> colleagues, um, Nate Seeger, who's with the U.S. Forest Service, and he's been a really big help um, to the state of Vermont and then the state of Maine and then the state of Rhode Island as uh, we started to deal with our new emerald ash borer infestations. And then Barbara Schultz is a forest health program manager at um, the Agency of Natural Resources, Forest Parks and Recreation. And I work for the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Um, so. Um, so where did emerald ash borer come from? Well, it came from Asia um, and probably came in what we call WPM, wood packaging materials, um, you know, crates or anything that stuff is shipped on. Um, when we tried to find out about it, it's a very obscure insect in its native region because it's held in control by native species there. It's not a pest. Nobody knew a thing about it. But it came here and it's just been rampaging through our forests. So um, it does not have any, well, there's one natural enemy, but it's not able to control it the emerald ash borer very much. So we first detected this pest in 2002 in Detroit, Michigan, but there are already thousands of trees that were dying in that area. So we know it's been there for a while. We think it probably came in in the mid 90s um, and remained undetected. <coughs> we didn't know what it was or what to look for. Um, and <coughs> in Michigan, they went through, um, uh, they did a lot of work to try to eradicate it. That's usually the goal for a new incoming invasive. You want to get rid of it before it gets established. Um, and what they did is every, any time they found a tree with emerald ash borer, they would remove all the host trees, all the ash species within a half mile radius, which made them very unpopular in suburban neighborhoods. Um, but it just didn't do the trick. Um, okay, that was the wrong way to push the button. So at this point, it's um, spread to 35 states. Now, the emerald ash borer left to its own devices. They'll fly maybe one or two miles a year. So this is about 2,000 miles. So the joke is that, yes, they only fly one or two miles a year, but they can go 65 miles an hour on the highway in the back of your truck when you're transporting firewood. So a number of states have set up firewood quarantines to prevent this or other pests from being moved along. Um, we initially found it in the state of Vermont in the town of Orange, and there was an alert young man named Colby Martell who was doing um, a current use program. Are you familiar with that? Current mm -hmm. use? Um, he was updating the management plan for a new client, and he had just been to this forest health meeting the year before that where all the foresters get together and are updated on current forest pests. And he said, gee, those those signs and symptoms sure look like emerald ash borer, and so he reported it on our website, vtinvasives.org, in the report it area. And we all looked at those photos and went, uh-oh. So we went out there and um, confirmed that it was indeed emerald ash borer. This is a larva. How many of you are familiar with it or have seen a specimen or know stuff about them? Okay, Andy does. Great, well, this will be an education for you all. So. Um, emerald ash borer is a federally regulated pest, and that means you have to follow the federal rules. And one of the rules is every new county in every state that finds emerald ash borer has to get it, um, has to submit it to an APHIS official for confirmation, so an APHIS identifier. So we can't just go around and say, oh, I found it. Um, 
so there's a, always a delay between when we've actually found the pest in a new county and when we can announce it um, because we have to send it out. They're pretty quick, except for the first one, which took them a week. We were all like, ah! Mm -hmm. um, so once we found it, we had to decide what we were going to do about it, how we were going to try to control its movement. Um, did we want to just open the floodgates and say, okay, we have it, let's just, you know, forget it, it's all over, we're doomed. Um, so there were a lot of discussions between the forest and parks people and the wood products industry and agency of ag, and um, we had a couple of choices we had to make. There's what we call the great big quarantine, this area in red at the time, and that was February 2018, um, is all the states that have emerald ash borer and they're under a federal quarantine. So by the federal rules, you can move ash products anywhere within that quarantine area. There's no limits. But, and this is what makes it confusing, states can have more strict regulations. So that's what we were trying to decide. But we had um, Sam Lincoln, who's the um, deputary, uh, deputy deputy, deputy um, commissioner of forests and parks, and he strongly advocated that we take a non-regulatory approach, that we try to get buy-in from the wood products industry um, and see how that went. So we decided not to quarantine, so we defaulted to the federal quarantine. So our state is now red. We're under the federal quarantine. We have no um, state quarantine about emerald ash borer, but we do have um, a rule that's an agency of agriculture rule. Whoops. We'll get back to this slide in a minute. Um, that basically says you can't move material that has a pest on it. So we had a compromise, which in this case is you can't move the wood if it's visibly infested, if it has woodpecker holes in it, or if you know your wood is infested. So we're, what we're trying to do is not impede the smooth flow of commerce. Um, and so to help people understand what was infested, what we did is, so the first find was in Orange, and it was right near this border of where the three counties, Washington, Caledonia, and Orange counties meet. And we drew a five-mile radius circle and then a 10-mile radius circle. And so this is highly likely to be infested. All the ash trees in this area are most likely infested, but they may not be visible. And then this outer area, it's quite likely they're infested. So we were asking people to consider this 10-mile radius infested and to not move wood products out of there. Or if people insisted on moving them, to at least do it during the non-flight season. So the adults are active in the summer. Um, so we ask people to not move wood products from June 1 to October 1. Um, actually, we started it as May 1st. That was a federal rules. And then we realized, you know what, it's too cold in Vermont. They never emerge, so we changed it. Ah, anyway. So um, that was the sort of regulatory background. And so we came up with the um, scientific name of the fried egg. This is a fried egg map, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and there's an updated version at vtinvasives.org, and I'll show you the latest one in a minute or two. All right, so in addition to our rule about just generally not moving pests, um, we do ask that people don't move the wood products during the flight season, don't move them out of the infested areas, or if you are going to insist on doing that, at least don't do it when they're flying. Um, and there's a whole series of recommendations for homeowners, for loggers, for all different types of people. So you can go to vtinvasives.org and, um, and look up those recommendations. And also Andy had mentioned that there's an emerald ash borer preparedness plan. It's something that urban and community forestry has developed for towns. It's, they have a, um, like a checklist of stuff you can kind of go through and think about doing and assemble people to figure out what are you going to do when your ash trees start dying? So a tree inventory of the trees along that can potentially be hazards is a useful step. And some conservation commissions, like I helped the Johnson Conservation Commission do that inventory. Um, and some people go hog wild. But it's just a good thing to think about. Of um, uh, I don't think this link is going to work, but I'll just try it anyway. Why not? Yes. Yeah. Never mind. Um, yeah, it's something to think about. And also, where are you going to put the wood if you have infested wood? When you take the trees down, where is that going to go? 
presumably somewhere which has emerald ash borer, not someplace that doesn't. So um, just stuff to think about. So, okay, so we found the pest, we figured out the regulatory structure, and then we were like, and where is it? <laughs> this is a pest that you can see it once woodpeckers attack the trees that it are in. You'll see woodpecker holes. Great, but mostly you don't see it until the trees start dying or the bark starts falling off and you're like, oh my gosh, there it is. So we tried to do some delineation surveys and what we initially did is we declared the towns that, where we had found emerald ash borer to be infested and we did not do visual surveys there. We just did the abutting towns. So we'd um, drive around. We'd send crews out with big maps and we'd give them some routes and they'd drive out and get out of the car and look at ash trees and record where they found suspected trees and then we'd send another team out um, to go check up on that. So that worked pretty well. But we've, um, we've decided now to include the towns that are infested because we don't, you know, so say you have an infested tree out there, is it the only one? Are there more? Is there a satellite infestation somewhere else? So we just want to have a sense of what people have to deal with. Okay, so we do those um, visual road surveys and then um, we also want to know where else is it like it's not fun to be taken by surprise by this thing so we put up some um, trap trees on state lands and um, a trap tree how many of you have ever heard of that trap tree <laughs> no, <Andy. laughs> so you cut about uh, 12 inches of the bark you just remove it and so it the tree starts putting out the pheromones of a distressed tree. Um, and it apparently is attractive to emerald ash borer. They like weakened and distressed trees. One of the reasons is that if they're in a big healthy tree, um, their life cycle can be delayed. It, takes, it usually takes one year for them to complete their life cycle. So you go egg, um, four larval stages, a nymph, and an adult. In a healthy tree, it can take them up to two years to go through that. So it slows them down if the tree is healthy. So anyway, um, the thing about the trap trees though is then you have to go out and you have to peel all the bark off. And my aching forearms can assure you that that is not a lot of fun, but it is a very effective trapping method. It's much more effective than the purple traps. Um, so in the summer of 2018, after we had found the insect, we put trap trees up. You'll notice this is um, mostly on state lands uh, just to see if we could find anything. And no, we didn't um, find anything out there, but we're doing uh, trap trees again this fall. And then another way of finding stuff is that people call and uh, tell us that they think they have a tree, and that's a great help. And we also have um, this report it function where you can upload pictures, and that's a really big help in evaluating whether somebody actually has an infested tree. Like for one thing, we can tell if it's an ash tree or not, usually. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Not everybody knows their trees. I totally understand. It's just if I go all the way up to Swanton and, thing, and we're asking people not to move firewood from the infested area to an uninfested area like Woodbury. But so, do you mean just not ash firewood or all firewood? Well, that's a good point. In general, uh, people like myself who work with invasives feel like don't move firewood. You don't know what's in it. You are bringing something from somewhere to a place that may not have whatever's in the wood, and there are always insects in the wood. You know, in this particular instance, it's like, yeah, if you could not move ash firewood from a known infestation, that would be good. But yeah. I'm not trying to bust your chops about that. So, I just, uh, so tell our firewood guy, right, don't to, bring to, us any ash. Right, if he's okay. willing to do that, I mean. He probably is. And one of the problems we've had is trying to communicate to people you know, a lot of firewood dealers, they're not internet users. Um, so try to do outreach at different events. Um, Forest and Parks did a survey and they say, oh yeah, everybody's complying with all the recommendations. And I'm like, the people who've talked to me are like, yeah, what? No, they're confused. <laughs> so, um, you know, but at this point, since it's in seven counties, it's, um, we can make it move around faster or we can try to slow it. That's about the only tool we have at the moment for dealing with it. 
was pretty much inevitable that it will yeah. wind up being statewide. Without right, but the question is how long it will take to expand. And so, you know, um, transporting wood products is going to make it expand faster. So being that though, it isn't wood right now, if you were to cut logs, you can sell them as saw logs and stuff like that out of state and so forth without it being an issue. In Woodbury? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. We are making the assumption that this is not infested and that you can still move your ash wood. Yep. Yeah. If you, um, you do have to make sure you're in compliance with the regulations from other states because they may have restrictions on moving stuff. So interstate movement, you would talk to um, the USDA plant protection quarantine. That's Tony Slowick. Um, or most people probably ignore it, which I'm going to pretend I didn't say, especially on film. <laughs> But if you're going to another state, um, they can have different laws about, um, state laws can be more restrictive than the federal <laughs> quarantine. So for the federal quarantine, I guess at this point, since we're in Vermont and we're in the federal quarantine, you could just move it to another state. But I would definitely contact that state ag agency and ask them what their rules are. So you're in compliance. Um, all right, what other things you have to worry about? How many of you have heard of spotted lanternfly? Okay, a couple of you. What do you guys know about it? I just heard about it. That's <laughs> Okay, how about you, sir, in the back? It's pretty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, do you know what they do that makes them a pest? Um, so, they're basically like a big aphid. And you know how aphids secrete honeydew? Yeah. They're a big honeydew secretor, so they basically <laughs> excrete green sticky goo all over everything and then you get sooty mold developing um, so it's a nuisance but they also um, attack crops like hops and grapes and other trees um, and they're not as lethal as the emerald ash borer but they're very abundant locally abundant so everything gets covered with sticky green ooze it turns into sooty mold and then they can cause um, how big are they um, yeah, they're um, <laughs> very good size. Um, so you can go, I'm sorry I didn't throw in more pictures, um, but they're, they're, they were first found in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania has tons of information about them. So if you just type in spotted lanternfly, you'll get one of their pest alerts, and it has a lot of information. Their um, nymph stage, this is an adult, um, is also very pretty. It's the first stages are black and then it turns black with white dots and then it turns red with black dots. So yes, it's very attractive and you're like, oh, the pretty insect. And then there are hundreds of them and you're like, ooh, not so nice. Yeah, so that's something we're watching out for. In theory, we're told they're not cold tolerant so that they won't necessarily make it to Vermont, but I've been hearing from the Pennsylvania folks that the tests they've done show that they're quite cold tolerant. Mm -hmm. And um, the winter before they were found in Pennsylvania was a very harsh one for Pennsylvania. And I checked the temperatures in the cities where that insect was found and compared it to Bennington, and they were very similar. So if it can survive that harsh Pennsylvania winter, it can survive at least in our southern towns. Hoping it doesn't get up here and that Pennsylvania's efforts to contain it will work very well. You said they were uh, mainly a pest of grapes and hops. Oh no, they have I think 70 different host okay. species. They have a lot of things they attack, but for agricultural concerns, <coughs> those are the ones that leap to mind. Um, another pest is the European cherry fruit fly, uh, Ragoletus cerasi. Um, it's been found in upper New York State along the Niagara River. And we are doing um, a survey on it. So it basically, to me, it looks like a deer fly with a yellow spot on the back. Um, but what they do is they lay their eggs and then they kind of turn the interior of the cherry to mush. You can imagine that this is an unpleasant surprise to find <laughs> when you're eating these. Um, and then it causes this ugly bruised look so fortunately most people won't bite into something like that um, and it goes after cherries hence the name it also um, seems to attack honeysuckles 
So we've been placing sticky cards, yellow cards coated with sticky goo, in five counties, I think, Essex, Orleans, Franklin, and two others. Uh, <laughs> oh, Grand Isle. I was like, what's south of Franklin County? Uh, um, yeah, I don't know why, but we're not putting them in Chittenden County. And maybe it's only four counties. It says five, but I wrote that. So. <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be five counties, but I might be leaving one up. There's nothing between Franklin and Orleans, right? Right. right. Okay, so it must be four counties. Um, so there are other species that look similar to this, but um, I imagine if you find any of them here, it will be a bad thing too. So yeah, we've hung 150 sticky cards, and they're replaced every two weeks, so we're vigilantly pursuing, searching for this. Um, how many of you remember the old spruce budworm outbreak that happened in the 70s, 60s, 70s? Yeah, I mm -hmm. um, so there is a big outbreak raging up in the northeastern part of Canada. Um, I'm sorry this is not a great depiction of it. And we have um, traps that we're monitoring to make sure it doesn't come here, but we're pretty sure it will come to Maine first. <laughs> so that will be our alarm bell. Um, our other friend is the Asian longhorn beetle that I'm so sure our education outreach has worked perfectly and shown you exactly what it looks like. How many of you know what it looks like? Kind of. <laughs> kind of? Okay, what color is it basically? That I don't remember. I remember it has two big, great big antennas. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah, um, so it's a big glossy black beetle. It's actually the size of my thumb and it has those big antenna um, white spots. If you see a huge beetle, just grab it, okay? Grab it, take a picture, send it to us. Just want to make sure. Um, they think they've eradicated it from Chicago, Illinois. They're trying to eradicate it from New York. I think they have the Staten Island infestation under control. Um, New York presented a lot of challenges. If you have a big tree in a courtyard of those giant apartment buildings, how on earth do you get out of there? Um, so they were cutting down all uh, host trees. Um, the Massachusetts infestation in Worcester, they also cut down a huge amount of trees. I went down to see that. I thought the whole city would be denuded of trees, but they um, were able to generate money to replant a lot. So some of the neighborhoods are very different. You know, they were obviously had big, beautiful trees, and now they have little saplings. But the forests, the woods still look um, okay, which is good to know. That infestation was there in Worcester for about 10 to 15 years before it was detected. So Asian longhorn beetles are homebodies too. They like to be in the same trees. Um, but I can't help but think if it had been there for 10 or 15 years, surely somebody has brought it to Vermont and we simply haven't found it. If you look at a map of Vermont and the forested areas in the southern part of the state, I mean, there are these huge forested areas that if it's there, it will take a while before we find it. Um, Ohio had a big infestation and um, the plan was to cut down 60,000 maple trees but the people in the towns kind of pushed back so instead of removing all the host species they only removed infested trees. Um, so that one is an ongoing struggle. Um, and then we have our friend the brown-tailed moth in Maine. Any of you heard of that? Okay, nondescript looking moth, but it has um, what are called urticating hairs. So they shed these hairs and they're an allergen. And you get like, itchy moth hairs all over you. It's worse than cats. Um, so, um, it stayed in Maine so far, but I, rumor has it it's crossed the river and might be in Portsmouth. So that is another thing. Um, we're watching out for and the way we're watching out for it, we're just simply asking our colleagues in New Hampshire to let us know if they find it. <laughs> so when they let those hairs go, is that a defense mechanism or they just shed them I all think over? they're just shedding them. I think like, they just truly yeah. like cats. Right, and then when they die, you know, the hairs all just get into the airstream. So um, That's particularly disgusting. Yes. Um, it is, and I would like it, and I've seen the, they make these little nests in the trees, so you go and you're like, oh, look now the bird's nest, and then you're like, hmm, not a bird's nest. <laughs> so, 
um, actually somebody was looking into using drones to treat them because you know if you could if you could sort of squirt them with something benevolent or unkind it would be easier than trying to blast them with a hose full of chemicals right um, anyway so those are, the, those are some of the things that um, are around us and you know who knows what else could show up right <laughs> And that's not even the aquarium. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Back to the emerald ash board. I've, mm -hmm. I read an article sometime mm -hmm. within the last two weeks, and I can't remember where. I think it might have been on Facebook or something. But mm -hmm. it talked about some new evidence that suggests that EAB may not kill 99% of the trees, and that there were a couple of places out somewhere near the Great Lakes that mm -hmm. where they found 75% of the white ash are still alive or have mm -hmm. you heard anything um, about that? Or? That was in northern Woodlands. Is that where it came from? Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, I um, have been uh, <coughs> um, so um, Barb Schultz, who's the Forest Health Program Manager, and I work closely together on these invasive issues. And um, I'm just going to pull up another PowerPoint in a second to show you a couple of quick pictures for identification purposes so you can see what signs and symptoms to look for. Um, and she and I have been having this discussion because we just had a conference in Burlington that was about black ash, um, cultural consequences for the tribes, and emerald ash borer. And those of us who attended felt imbued with a sense of urgency to get biocontrols out there to help save the ash, that we really need to get going on this, that in the Midwest you're not seeing ash tree species recovery, you're losing them from the landscape, you're losing their ecological functions. Um, but then Barb read a paper that discussed that, that there might be greater survivorship, but that would only be for the white ash, and black ash, and um, Green ash seem to be pretty, and yeah, brown ash, black ash are pretty much the same, are often referred to as the same tree, um, are still seeing very high mortality rates. So it's great if the white ash aren't being decimated as, as high a percentage rate, but even 75% mortality is quite a bit. So. Um, is the bathroom still? Not an ash tree. <laughs> <laughs> Should have checked first. Um, and then some people, like they know their local forester or something, and they'll call them and they can go out and look at it. So any way you have of um, letting us know what you found is, is a big help. Um, so yeah, in addition to finding emerald ash borer in Vermont in 2018, it also showed up um, in Massachusetts right here. That was a surprise to us because they did the same thing. If you do the fried egg, this is a five miles radius, 10 mile, that put it in the lower three towns of Vermont. And then it was found in Madawaska, Maine. I'm sure you all heard of that place, right? right. And, um, and it actually, they had found it in Canada right across the river. And so we sent Nate Siegert, who's like an EAB bloodhound up there and sussed it out. And he found a tree and ta-da, Maine was infested. Um, then later that summer, sort of like a detective story, and then, and then, we found um, adults in two <laughs> separate traps, bless you, in the town of Stamford, um, which is right down there, and they were fairly far apart. I'm reasonably certain they're females that flew out of that Massachusetts infestation that I mentioned. Some females can actually fly as far as 20 miles away, but mostly they're home bodies and they stick close to where they originated. Um, all right, so then we found it in um, Grand Isle County in South Hero. And um, if you haven't seen signs and symptoms before, they make these characteristic uh, serpentine galleries. They start out teeny tiny because they're little larvae and they chew their way through. Um, and I don't know if you can see it that well here, but they're, um, one thing I look for is these woodpecker pecks of um, the woodpeckers going after the emerald ash borer. Woodpeckers are a good natural enemy. They can find and eat up to 80 to 90 percent of the insects, the emerald ash borer in the trees. So put up your woodpecker boxes. Are any of you birders? Okay. Someone. Yeah. 
So that's another good way to find them too, is if you see a bunch of woodpeckers up in a tree, if it's an ash tree, be like, ah, call Judy. Yeah. Did exit hole, D-shaped exit D-shaped exit holes, you know, D-shaped exit holes, unless I see them with a couple of other signs or symptoms, I'm just like, who knows? I mean, there are other species um, similar to emerald ash borer, that same shape, other agrilis, like the two-line chestnut borer, so, um, but you can see actually an exit hole right here. Thank you for reminding me about those. Yeah. So if we see ash trees with pieces of bark missing, but there's no trails like that, it's some other thing we should assume? or Probably. You could okay. also keep an eye on the tree because, yeah. you know, I always try to figure out what's killing the tree. Almost, yeah, I'm keeping an eye on the tree. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me nervous. Um, so w you will sometimes see woodpecker holes if the tree has a wound in it. Um, wounds let in what are called secondary pests, so that's a pest that will help contribute to the decline of the tree, it won't necessarily kill the tree outright. Um, these will kill the tree eventually because they girdle it, these galleries will um, cut off all circulation, bless you, um, from water and nutrients going up and down. How many years does it take to, once the tree gets infested? One to five years, so it depends on the health of the tree and also how fast the emerald ash borers are um, reproducing and apparently they are you know a lot of them will just lay eggs on the same tree that they were born on but one or two will fly off and start satellite infestations so have they been found in woodbury no but they let's go back to that map for a second where it was <laughs> right <laughs> so let's see um, so it's, it's in these towns. We found it in um, Barry, Plainfield, Groton, and Orange. In uh, Groton and Plainfield, we found it fairly close to the three-county border. But it is in um, Montpelier. Um, and so Woodbury... Yeah, but the upper, upper top, the very top, top right? right? Yep. No, no left. Yep. That's Cabot. Yeah. That's Woodbury, That's yes. Okay, so yeah, if I were you, I would be keeping an eye out on my ash trees. Um, you know, we tell people you, I don't know, how many of you log or have wood lots and stuff? Okay, so we're not necessarily recommending that you cut all your trees down. You can if you want your ash trees. Um, if it has not been found in your town, you still have some time to grow the trees a little more. Um, they say if it's in about, you know, 10 or 15 miles, so you're, you know, you're further than. I'm trying to find my map. Right, so you guys are, are here? There, yes. Yep. Right, and so this is a 10 mile radius. So if you have a woodlot, you might think about thinning your ash or talk to a forester about your best approach. You're certainly not right in the danger zone, but it's getting near enough to um, start planning for it, sorry to say. All right, so we found them there. Um, right. Um, so then there were other discoveries in New England. The Grafton County, New Hampshire, I thought was this year. Um, Maine, they found it in York, and then they found it in Rhode Island too. Rhode Island was just like, they don't have much of a staff for dealing with it, so they've just thrown up their hands. Um, New Hampshire has had um, a five-county quarantine for a number of years. They first found it there in 2011 or 13, I don't remember. It was I think 13, 2013 they found it. Um, but they've decided once it got to Grafton County, they went statewide with their quarantine. So Maine is now the only New England state without a statewide or without being part of the federal quarantine, they're still doing a bi-county quarantine, which makes sense because, of course, they found the bugs at the opposite ends of the state. All right. Um, so in 2019, um, this is in Bristol, so we were asked to look unhappy. <laughs> did, a good, did a good job. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see it, and you can come up later and we can show you these slides, but this is densely packed with the tunnels the larvae make as they eat the wood. It, this entire tree, it's like seeing somebody with, covered with tattoos, every inch had larval tunnels. And um, 
This is showing, oh, and this is the one that we found in Derby. So this is a cautionary tale for you. Um, so my colleague, Bethany Creaser, sent some photos and said, I think this tree has EAB. And I'm like, nah, I don't think so. So she said, well, I'll get a draw knife and I'll peel it. So she peels it and sends more photos. And I'm like, yeah, no, I think those tunnels are too fat. And besides, look, it's got a great big wound. This has to be secondary pests that are causing what you see. So she got the county forester to come and collect a sample. They found an insect. They showed me a picture. I'm like, yeah, that just doesn't look like EAB. They sent it off. <laughs> it's so wrong on <laughs> so many levels. <laughs> so these tunnels can get um, quite wide. And you know, when I first saw them, I'm like, that's not EAB, that's like the lilac borer. It makes these vertical tunnels. Um, but when I went up, then I saw the teeny serpentine tunnels that didn't show up on the photos. And I'm like, so what I said about trees having wounds and secondary pests, now I'm like, OK, I need to check. Because it might, not, it might actually be the emerald ash borer. I can't what is just it about the ash trees that allow the emerald ash borer to do ash trees, not other trees? But I don't know why they're species specific. And it turns out they go after the white fringe tree, which is a species I've never heard of. Have you? Fringe white, tree? Yeah, white fringe tree? Yeah, I've heard of them. Okay. They have them down country. Okay. Well, um, yeah. So um, I learned, you know, learning by doing. Like, okay, now I can't assume just because it has a wound that it's not emerald ash borer. All right, so we currently have. Um, seven counties that are infested. We found the one in Bristol, the town of Orange, um, Plainfield, right, Groton. In Bennington, it's in Stanford. Um, Grand Isle, it's in South Hero. In Orleans, it's in Derby Line. Um, I will say, the other funny thing about all these is they're all separate. So often, Emerald Ash Borer will send out a, you know, you'll have a satellite infestation, like one of those females will go off and start a new infestation. But these are too far for that. So it's sort of curious. This one was clearly somebody bringing firewood to a campground. Um, this one, we know there's been an EAB infestation in Quebec and south of Montreal for many years. So um, if you had taken all the foresters in Vermont and put us all in a room and asked us where we thought we would find emerald ash borer, no one, no one would have said orange Vermont. <laughs> so that central Vermont infestation was a real surprise to us. And um, I met a bunch of the landowners and my colleagues in Forest and Parks were saying, oh, they brought it in on firewood, they have camps. I'm like, they don't need firewood, they're in a forest with a million <laughs> trees. <laughs> so they're like, well, ask them. I'm sure they brought in firewood. And I asked them, of course, they laugh. <laughs> they're like, oh, why would we need to bring in firewood? There are a million trees. So I don't know how that central Vermont infestation got started. Do they have campgrounds, like commercial campgrounds? Um, well, it's near the Groton State Forest mm. campground system, but we haven't found any in there yet. And mm. they're all looking. Um, so all I can think is maybe it came in on building materials that people were building a camp or you know, building a shed or building a deer stand or something, and it came in on that. Um, yeah, and the Bristol one, I mean, some people have firewood near there. And I, you know, these flew in. So um, they don't leave a note explaining how they got there. <laughs> all right. Um, so you might be asking, what can you do about emerald ash borer? Um, are you interested, or I could skip this? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So um, one thing is to learn how to recognize it. And it looks like I'm talking fast enough that I might be able to show you um, a PowerPoint which has some um, things you can look for. Um, if you do find it where you think you have it, um, go to the reported feature on vtinvasives.org. Um, and that will also show you an updated map so you can keep track of where the insect is and if it's moving closer to Woodbury. Um, yeah, and don't move it. <laughs> if, don't move firewood. It's that simple. Um, I know Vermonters and people in New England tend to be thrifty. And who wants to pay firewood prices at a campground for wet wood, right? But if you can try to um, either get heat-treated firewood or make sure there are no insect holes in your wood or buy it locally, that would be a big help. Um, 
And then, you know, you can have an EAB preparedness plan. You can um, join the first detectors, which trains you in the identifying um, insect pests, particularly Agent Longhorn Beetle and Emerald Ash Borer. Um, and we've also started organizing our first, any of first detectors in here? Okay. It's a good group. And um, um, we asked them to hang purple traps for us this year because the USDA is trying to deregulate emerald ash borer and they are not paying for contractors to hang the purple traps and they're not paying the salaries of um, USDA staff to hang the traps. So we would like to know where the insects are. So we were soliciting volunteers um, and that is very helpful. Um, and then people, you know, like I said, they report stuff that they've seen. Um, one yeah. question, you sure. said don't move firewood. Right. And the question is, what do you mean exactly by don't move firewood? For example, we get our firewood right. uh, from a guy in Plainfield, right. which is very close to where it is. Right, which is what, so Plainfield would be one of those towns we consider infested. And yeah. so maybe Woodbury is going to have <laughs> EB soon. Well, we don't have ash trees, so, you know, right. whatever. They fly, though, yeah. those little devils. Oops, all right, I missed that. Um, well, they don't bring ash, though, do they? So yeah. when we say don't move firewood, that would be a perfect example. We had that fried egg. Uh, a problem? Um, you know, there was that big outbreak in 88, 89, and then they haven't really um, come back in a statewide manner. I think there are occasional spurts of them in localized areas. Another thrips, if you want to worry about something, is the western flower thrips. Mm -hmm. So uh, greenhouse growers, it's an enormous pest in other states. It hasn't made it to Vermont yet. Um, also hard to see, hard to find, hard to collect. Good stuff. All right, let me just quickly show you if you are patient. Um, um, this is just to show you the size of an adult. And um, so um, these are what the eggs look like. They're like teeny tiny. I don't know how anybody would ever see them. I saw some live on a tree and I'm like, what? Uh, again, these are the serpentine galleries um, starting out small, getting bigger, there's the actual larva. Um, these are some of the bark galleries. Sorry, I'm rushing through this. Um, one interesting thing is these are larvae that are usually in a, you know, straight line, but when they prepare to pupate, they form into this J shape. They call it the J larval phase. And it's just kind of a cool thing. Um, so anything that kills them? Um, or treat something or yeah, I mean, the standard insect killing, here we go, um, in, uh, chemicals kill them, but some of those are neonicotinoids that kill bees too. Mm -hmm. It's not really high risk to treat an ash tree with a neonic because they're not usually flowering when you treat them and you're doing trunk injections. Some people do uh, soil drenches that can be slightly higher risk for bees. Um, there's also a couple of um, non-chemical products. So um, emmamactin benzoate is a product that's not neonicotinoid. Um, and there's um, something called treeazin, and they use that up in Montreal to treat their trees. So um, you can treat trees that are infested. If it's a really heavy infestation, that treatment might not work, but you can also treat preventively. It is expensive, and you have to do it every couple of years, depending on the product you've used. Um, we also had a case where the um, people who treated the trees, they did not inject ash trees. <laughs> so it's good if you... So I've been recommending to people, it might be more expensive, but if you get um, an arborist to look at your trees to determine whether um, they're good candidates to save, and then get um, a pest control operator to actually treat them, so that the arborist is working for you and not making money off of the treatments. You know, it's just, I'm not saying people are dishonest, but it just removes a slight, well, it's like having a forestry consultant and a logger. The forestry consultant is your advocate for what you want. The logger is gonna remove the trees. If the logger is your forestry consultant, they have an economic interest in removing trees. It's not good or bad, it's just how that 
works economically. All right, so just to quickly show you some of the signs and symptoms. So epicormic branching, that's when you're going to see small branches coming out of the lower part of the trunk. Well, why describe what I can show? So you'll see it here. They start um, coming out of the sides of the tree. There's this tree is dead, um, but you're seeing these branches sprouting out. Um, bark cracks. You'll see the bark start cracking. Sometimes you can see the galleries. Uh, here you can particularly see the gallery because somebody pulled the bark off. Um, but we did find the one in Barry that way. Um, here's a better example. So this is what you might see on an ash tree is this type of crack and then you go investigate it or you see if there are exit holes or epicormic sprouts. Um, so they're the D-shaped holes. I've looked at a lot of trees and a lot of holes. I would never claim it was EAB just based on the exit hole unless I peeled the bark and saw the galleries and then I'd say, aha, uh -huh. um, not sure what this is depicting, possibly um, woodpecker pecks. These look more like D-shaped holes. There are some woodpecks. So um, this is a woodpeck and there's another one. So some trees you'll only see one or two woodpecks way up in the canopy and the insects attack the canopy first. That's where you're first going to see them. So by the time uh, these signs are obvious to us, it's usually the infestation has been there for a while. And that's a problem and that's why you can't eradicate it. We just don't know where it is. Sometimes like in the Groton um, find, we had to cut a tree down and peel the upper branches to find a larvae to demonstrate that we had that insect in that town. But we knew it had to be there because it was just so close. Um, another thing is um, what they call bark flecking. Sometimes they call it ash um, blonding, which is a confusing term. There's a fungus that's also been attacking ash tree that you'll see sunken gray bark. And so at first we were confusing the sunken gray bark with blonding. But this is a woodpecker's, their feet knock off chunks of bark. So in addition to the woodpecker holes, you'll see this almost reddish or orange color on the trees because they've scraped the flecks of bark off. Um, and that jumps out at you once you know what you're looking for. All right. Um, just wanted to show you that. Any questions about their biology, life cycle? Yeah. Uh, not so much the biology, but I wanted to make sure I understood you about a, a regulated approach mm -hmm and a non-regulated approach, and the federal quarantine. If you have the federal quarantine, do the issues of whether you should be regulated or non-regulated go away because of the quarantine? No, well, it, it varies state by state. So you have, we have the federal quarantine, and there's certain rules people have to follow to ship wood out of state. I mean, they have to follow the federal quarantine rules or out of the country. Um, we could have, as a state, put more restrictive rules. Um, and we chose not to, to just have those recommendations. But there is a pre-existing rule about not moving pests. So we have the ability to regulate if we feel like people are, you know, sort of violating the spirit of not moving wood that we're trying to. Um, have you seen any encourage. evidence of that? I, I think firewood dealers have been moving wood a little bit. It's it's hard to regulate, you know. We're given really we're in seven counties now. Do you think we should be <coughs> more aggressive, or do you feel the uh, strategies we have are fine? Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is protect the the ash that's in um, Windsor County. It's a very ash rich county, and it has not been infested yet. So anything that and some of these areas are fairly small. I mean, we're not talking about hundreds of miles. We're talking about, you know, like 10 miles <coughs> of infestation. Um, if we can contain that and not deliberately spread it elsewhere, then we can help people who have woodlots elsewhere, um, you know, get some more meat on their ash trees or um, have time to do a reasonable management <coughs> plan and not have to madly cut everything down to salvage what they can or lose the value of their ash. So, um, you know, it's all new, too. You know, it's funny, I've been preparing for this insect's arrival for <coughs> 11 years, and I was just stunned by how little we really understood about the impact it was going to have until it got here. Um, 
and, you know, like where do you dispose of the wood, the hazard trees, who's bearing the cost, it's really going to fall on towns. Yeah. Is there any evidence of resistance developing in trees? Well, we're looking for it. And so, and sometimes um, we've been encouraging people not to cut ash trees, but as one uh, gentleman who does a lot of logging pointed out to me, you can't get rid of all the ash. It's going to stay out there. So we are certainly looking for um, resistant trees. And that'll be easier on state lands, but you know they're going to remove some of their ash too. But that's a lesson we learned. Your, um, I don't know if you remember is the right word, but you know there was that um, chestnut blight that took out all, and people just cut all their chestnut and you know just eliminated it, and that was a problem because there was no stock left for resistance. So there are those um, they call them lingering white ash when the emerald ash borers go through. They some of the ash trees will stick around a little longer. So, you know, we're trying to get... Chestnut will sprout right. after you cut it down. Right. So I've seen lots of chestnut right. trees, but they just aren't very right. big. Right. And um, the emerald ash borer can attack ash trees that are as little as um, one or two inches in diameter. So the, the thing we're trying to do is get the ash trees to live to reproductive age so they can produce seed. Because their seed only lasts in the seed bank, we think, three or four years. Um, and so that's why the USDA is moving from uh, monitoring and detection to biocontrol. And the hope is if we can introduce biocontrol agents, um, once the, you know, the first wave has gone through and taken out most of the ash, then there should be enough of the biocontrols um, insects around to suppress that remaining emerald ash borer population to let some of those ash grow up and reproduce. And that's the idea. I'm curious because when yeah. I retired, mm -hmm. the only thing that we knew of at that time was that wasp. Right. What other um, biocontrol insects are they? So there are four wasps. There's Tetrasticus, there's Uobius, um, and there's two Spathius species. One is cold tolerant and one is cold intolerant. And there's a native. So there is a native? There is a native. Okay. Um, so. Um, I don't know if that's in a breeding program or not yet, but um, certainly, um, so we're just looking for a site to release them, which you have to ask landowners to not cut for five years, so it's kind of a major commitment if you have a woodlot to not cut your ash. But. So that's where we're moving to. We're trying to establish these biocontrols and see if they'll help. Um, Is yeah. the native species also here in Vermont? Yeah, yeah, we have it here in Vermont. Do you know what the market's like now for selling ash? ash um, it was so pretty good. Um, I think the tariff stuff has changed it a little, but the last I heard, ash was still selling well, which is a good thing because there's a lot available now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're thinking of your woodlot. Well, I heard they were shipping some down to Pennsylvania because they lost their ash and their, their mills need ash trees, so they've been shipping some down there. Yeah, well, there you go, a market. <laughs> it is kind of sad. Um, any other insect questions? Or now that I got y'all depressed? <laughs> <laughs> now, if you want to depress and talk about ALV, that's I, that, you know. Yeah, there, there's something that affects um, uh, all the fir trees at the base, and they they wind up blowing over, and something's infecting the bottom of them. Do you know what that is? I don't actually. No. Now I have a new thing to worry about. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't, but I can try to look. If you want to give me your name and email, I can try to find out something about that. Um, anything else? So when you buy firewood, usually around here, usually you get a fair amount of ash. Yep. Sure, why not? Everybody's getting rid of their ash. <laughs> Especially in the places we don't want them moving it out. Mm, yeah. Well, it's good firewood, you know. Right. Um, so if you get a load of firewood, and there's some ash in it, and especially if it's from a known infested area, yep. then if you see some signs of infestation, what would you do? Give me a call. <laughs> call me. Call me, and I'll come over and take a look and confirm it. And, you know, I mean, if you think it's infested, burn it or put it somewhere where the bugs can't get out, you know? I mean, if you have a giant ton of firewood, I don't, excuse me, you know what you're going to do, really, besides um, be like, oh, <laughs> that was a bad idea. I mean, that's what's so hard is people move wood all the time. Yeah. So, um, you know, we prefer you not get it from an infested area if you're outside of the infested area. 
but all we can do is ask. Or if I find out you're doing it, I can bust you for it, but there's one of me and many of you. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just... So if I have a bunch of ash cut down, like, a lot of it is infested, should I just cut it up immediately and put in the firewood, or do, 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 how long do they stay in there? How so one of the recommendations we make is if you do have logs, they're not visibly infested, you can take them to a mill if you can alert the mill that you're coming and that your logs are from an infested area and so they'll jump them up and process them right away um, you know so what we're trying to do is minimize risks basically you know if your logs have them it's not the grow it's not the flight season so if they're all like in larval phase in the tree that's lower mm -hmm. risk if they're adults and you're moving them that's higher risk because they're just going to exit and fly away and infest something else you see what i mean so if you can move them between October 1 and June 1, that's ideal. And if you can tell the mill you're coming, then they can, you know, debark them and process them. And that's lower risk because they'll chip the bark or boil it or whatever, and they'll just get rid of that. And then the insects are only in that top, you know, outer part of the tree. Yeah. So. Um. Do they, they die from, will they die from the top down? Yeah, you'll start seeing dieback in the upper branches and yeah. things like that. But I mean, ash are in decline in a lot of places. I've looked at a lot of ash that I don't know why they're declining. We don't know. Foresters don't know. Um, could be drought susceptibility. Could be too wet. Could be a variety of things attacking them over time. Um, I mean, I went to this one place and there were four beautiful ash trees in a row. Same condition, same slope same everything. Two of them were ter in terrible health and two were in perfect health. And I'm like, why is that? Genes. Yeah. Genes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's mysteries of life. All right. Well, thank you. So, any more questions? Well, so can we can find a lot of this information on the website? Yeah. Yep. And um, I mean, I could leave you the PowerPoint too, I suppose, if you... Well, and Nate's too. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you go to that vtinvasives.org, um, it will have a section of recommendations. You have to, if you go to, um, I think it's land invasives, and then you'll see the emerald ash borer updates, go to that site, and it should take you to the, um, you know, homeowner. Show you the maps. And the show you the maps and the recommendations and what you can do as a homeowner, what you can do. has treatment options for your trees. So, so is it you we should call, or is it... USDA for if we think we have an emerald ash borer. Um, you can go to that website and, and sh okay. if you have if you can take pictures, it's really helpful. And it, it has a report it <coughs> section, and you can just upload photos. And then we have a group that it gets sent to, and we discuss it and decide like yes, it is, no, it isn't, or we send somebody out. It sounds phone. like you're doing all that. It sounds like you go everywhere. I go to a lot. There are a lot of us. There are a lot of calls. But the county foresters take some, foresters take some, the UCF people take some. So, so thanks. Thanks for your help. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.